But let's pause and take a few minutes to pray together. Let's, let's all pray. <coughs> Dear Lord our God, we thank you that your son that you have sent into the world is our Lord Emmanuel. We thank you for the truth of that name, God with us. And Lord, we thank you that you're the God who is always with us, that you never leave us or forsake us. Thank you that we can trust in your presence day by day, in all of the trials that we face, in all of the challenges of this life. Lord, we are so aware of just how much we need you with us. And Lord, we thank you so much that uh, in our Christmas celebrations, we can uh, rejoice that you're not just with us in a, in a vague sense. But Lord, we thank you that you have sent your son to come and to be with us, to be in this world. To be able to sympathise with our weaknesses, to experience our struggles. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who has come down to us and you know what it is to be tired and to be hungry, to grieve, to, to suffer pain. Lord, thank you that you know what it is to die, to face injustice. And so, Lord, we, we thank you that in all of our trials we can look to you, that you are a God who is not just with us, but that you're a God who knows us and knows our every need. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to trust in you. Help us, Lord, in every circumstance to look to you and to rely on your grace. Lord, we, we thank you that you are a God who has given us this gift of your Son freely. Thank you for that wonderful news that we can celebrate and that we can rejoice that you have given us a saviour. Lord, you have not asked us to clamber up and climb our way to you, but Lord, you have come down to us. We thank you so much for that truth that we see at Christmas, that you have sent the Saviour to us. You have bridged the gap between us and you have made a way by which we can be reconciled and brought back into your family. Lord, we thank you that we've been able to hear the, the children singing those songs to us this morning, to be singing those truths to us. Lord, we pray that those songs would stick in their minds, that as they grow up, they would remember what they are learning. And Lord, we pray that they wouldn't just remember it, but that they would come to believe it and to hold on to the Lord Jesus for themselves. We pray, Lord, that you would grant to them that childlike faith. And Lord, we pray that as we've heard those songs, that that would be true for each of us. Lord, for those of us who know you and love you and follow you, Lord, we pray that hearing those truths would reignite our faith and that we would have a renewed passion and zeal for you. Lord, for those who are walking with you and, and have that love for you, Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us in it and that we wouldn't drift or grow cold in the truth of your word. Lord, we pray for those with us this morning who don't know you, who don't know the truth of what the children have been singing this morning, Lord, we pray that this morning they would see for the first time that the arrival of the Lord Jesus isn't just a reason to give gifts and put up lights and trees, but Lord, we pray that they would see that the arrival of the Lord Jesus is a reason to place all of our faith and our hope in you, the living God who has given us your Son. So Lord, help us now as we come to the Bible Help us to think about what it means and what it says and help us to apply it to our lives. Because Lord, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I was thinking about what we could sing over this Christmas period, I went through a list of all sorts of carols and other songs. Not all of these would be suitable to sing in church. I'd just want to reassure you of that. But uh, a whole bunch of different Christmas songs. And I wonder, if I read these out to you, 
Can you spot the common theme? I know you will, but look out for it. We've just sung, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Or, or how about, little donkey, little donkey, on the dusty road. Or, a favourite of many, away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. Uh, the pop classic, have yourselves a merry little Christmas, let your heart be light. Once in royal David city stood a lowly cattle shed, where a mother laid her baby in a manger for his bed. Mary was that mother mild, and Jesus Christ her little child. And then one song that I've never understood, the little drummer boy, little baby, pa pum pum <laughs> I'm sure you can probably think of a whole host of other Christmas carols where that word little appears. Before your mind races off to think of all of the Christmas carols <laughs> with little in it, and you come to tell me at the door, stay with me for a moment. Uh, because it got me wondering, why have we got this idea in our heads that Christmas is little? Now, wh why do we think Christmas is something so small? What is so little about Christmas? There are some things that are little in the Christmas story, but there's also some very large things in the Christmas story. And I think, actually, if you understand the smallness and the greatness of the Christmas story, then you actually get to the very heart of what Christmas is all about. And so I want us to think, very simply, about those two things, the little and the large of Christmas. Let me read to you some verses from Luke's Gospel. Luke uh, chapter 2, they should appear on the screen. There we go. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. We read this. In those days... A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. So there is that pivotal moment, the key moment in the Christmas story. This is the main event. This is what it's all about. But we find that everything is very, very small. But we're told that Mary gives birth to, if we go, oh, I've not got this on, that would help, wouldn't it? There we go. Uh, we find that Mary gives birth to her firstborn son. As I said at the beginning, last Sunday we were in the hospital uh, having our second child, a little baby girl, and she was quite small. She was seven pounds and two ounces. Now, we're not told the birth weight of Mary's son, are we? That detail isn't included for us. I doubt they had a set of scales in the stable. But there's one thing that all babies have in common, isn't there? Even the biggest of babies, they're still very small. You can cradle them in your arms. You can rock them to sleep. This is one thing that the carols definitely get right. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. Yes, exactly. He would have been very little. But it's not only Jesus himself who was very small. The place where Jesus was born is also very small. Now, we read that Mary and Joseph travelled to Bethlehem to be with the rest of Joseph's family line. 
They are there to register in a census. And it's there that Mary gives birth. So here again, this pivotal moment in the Christmas story. And where does it happen? Bethlehem. Uh, in the passage, it's called uh, the city of David. But city is a little bit misleading. Today, Bethlehem is a large city. But if you were to go back to the time in which the Bible was written, it would be better to call Bethlehem a village. It seems as if the population would have only been around 500, maybe less at the time that Jesus was born. And that's not 500,000, just 500. So again, the carols get it mostly right, don't they? Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Oh, little village doesn't quite have the same ring to it, does it? But here is this key moment in the Christian story, and it takes place in a very small village. A little baby born in a little place to little parents. I don't mean by that that Mary and Joseph were physically small. What I mean is that they are of little importance. Joseph had a good job, an important job, but let's be honest with ourselves, it's not a sort of job that gets the amount of respect it deserves. He was a carpenter, or perhaps in our time, he would be a, a handyman. If you've ever had to call on a handyman, then you know how important handymen really are. But if you were to list off the top 100 jobs that are most influential in our society, that hold the levers of power, I doubt the handyman would make the list. In Joseph's village, Nazareth, everyone would have known him. Your table is wobbly? Call Joseph. <coughs> Your door has fallen off its hinges? Call Joseph. They all know him in Nazareth, but outside of that little town, Joseph who? Nobody knows the name of Joseph. He's a local carpenter whose influence doesn't stretch far beyond one small village. And what about Mary? And bear in mind that in this, in this society at that time, women didn't really have the time of day. The world at that time didn't even trust women to be a witness in a court of law, let alone to have the vote or to break the glass ceiling. And specifically for Mary, she's young. We believe that she's young. No one really knows how young, possibly mid to late teens, and she's engaged to the local handyman. They sound like a lovely couple, don't they? They sound like a very sweet young couple, but they're nothing special, really. And they're not the kind of people that you would expect to raise a son who would turn the world upside down. And yet that is exactly what happened. So we've seen the, the little side of Christmas, a small baby born in a small village to quite insignificant parents. But it's from those very small and humble beginnings that we arrive at something incredible. Let's think secondly about the large side of Christmas. Uh, I'm going to read the next part uh, of that passage from Luke. Luke 2, <coughs> verses 8 to 20. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. For look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, a saviour who was born, was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a great multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to people he favours. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. 
they hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. As the angels announced the birth of this little baby boy in a little town, it becomes very clear that even though this nativity scene is very small, very humble, there is actually something much bigger going on behind the scenes. They make these big claims about this baby boy. In verse 11, they claim that the baby born in the manger is the Messiah, the Christ. That is quite a claim, isn't it? This little boy is the long-awaited saviour. You know, if you go right back to the very beginning, to Adam and Eve, they heard that promise from God that he would send someone to crush the head of Satan. If you go back a long, long time ago, you get to Abraham, and he heard that promise from God that he would send someone from his family line to bless all nations of the earth. David, King David, he had that promise that one of his descendants would sit on the throne of an eternal kingdom. Isaiah, the prophet, he promised a suffering servant who would come to die in the place of sinners. All of these amazing promises. And the angels are saying, yes. And he's lying in a stable in Bethlehem. You see, there's more to Joseph than meets the eye. He may just be the local handyman from an obscure village in Galilee, but he's actually got royal blood running through his veins. At this time, the Roman Empire, they'd set up some phony king, King Herod. But Joseph, he's actually from the family line of King David. The baby in the manger, he may only be small, but he is actually the rightful king of Israel. And more than that, he is the promised offspring of Abraham who would bring blessing to all the nations. More than that, he is the one who was promised to Adam and Eve that would come and crush Satan's head. But you know, they're actually, these angels, they're actually making an even bigger claim than this. Not just that the baby in the manger is the promised Messiah, they call him the Lord. And when you think of a Lord, don't think of Keir Starmer promising to abolish the House of Lords. Uh, think instead of uh, maybe the scene of, of a butler uh, who waits on a table and calls their master Lord, that they owe them respect and obedience that they owe them honour. And so here, this baby, this tiny little baby, is the Lord, someone who deserves honour and respect and obedience. That is why the wise men come and bow down before him, isn't it? But you know, there's something, something even bigger hidden away in this word, the Lord. And maybe it's the biggest claim of them all. You see, this word, the Lord, it appears all over the Bible. In almost every page, that word Lord appears. And in pretty much every single instance, it's talking about the same person, with maybe one or two exceptions. This word Lord is talking about God himself. The angels are not just claiming that this baby is the king. They're not just claiming that he's Abraham's promised son. They're not just claiming that he's the serpent crusher. Not just that he's to be respected and obeyed. No, this baby is none other than God himself, who has come down to us. The infinite God can be carried in Mary's arms. The immeasurable God, 
weighs less than a stone. The eternal God has breathed air into his lungs for the first time. The air that he made. The mind boggles at the immensity of what has just taken place. Big claims and big news. The angel's announcement is good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, the city of David, a saviour was born for you. The arrival of the infinite God into our world is good news. Because when Jesus grew up, he said these words, John 3, 17 and 18. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. The Messiah, the Lord, he came on a mission to save to rescue, to deliver people from their sin. You don't need to look very far, do you, to see that our world is broken. Wars, famines, poverty, hatred, division. Something is seriously wrong with our world, isn't it? And the Bible's diagnosis of our problem is sin. We've been cut off from the God who made us, the God who loves us, because we are sinners. We've broken his laws, and he is holy and pure, and he can't even look at sin. And so the angel's announcement comes as incredible news. Here is the saviour. This very small child, he comes on a life-changing planet-altering mission to reconcile the sinner with their God, the creature and their creator. You might be wondering, how on earth does he do that? How can a little child, born in a little town to little parents, how can he solve all of the problems that have been caused by sin? Good question. The little child didn't stay little, did he? He grew up. He would have learned the skills of carpentry from his dad. He learned the hard graft of making things by hand. But then at the age of 30, his real mission in life began. He travelled across the country, teaching, preaching and performing miracles. He showed love and grace and kindness wherever he went. And you see that wherever Jesus goes, the effects of sin are undone. They are reversed. The blind can see again. The lame can walk again. The deaf can hear again. The dead can live again. And sinners were forgiven. And then at the age of 33, this perfect, sinless, kind and gracious man. He was betrayed by one of his own. He was falsely accused and he was wrongfully imprisoned. In a sham of a trial, he's condemned to die for no reason. Even the judge himself says, this man has done nothing deserving of death. So there he is beaten within an inch of his life by the Romans, paraded through the streets and nailed to a cross to die. One New Testament writer says this, God made the one who didn't know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, that verse is saying this is all to put into effect a swap. The Lord of heaven and earth came down to the manger and died on a cross so that we, sinners like you and me, 
we could be forgiven and washed clean and brought into the family of God. This is big news. The Saviour is born. Just one more thought. We've seen the little child born in a little town to little parents, uh, but we've seen the large claims that are made about this child, the, the, the big news that the Saviour has arrived. But let me just close by speaking about the large, in fact, the global impact that this little child has made. In the angels' announcement, they say, don't they, that, uh, it, don't be afraid, I, I proclaim good news of great joy that will be for all people. This goes out to everyone. In our final song, we're going to sing these words, joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth receive her king, let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing, no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. Joy to the world. He came to bring the joy of sins forgiven to every nation on the planet. We see that, don't we? In the way that Christmas is celebrated across the globe. He comes to make his blessings flow. How far? How far do his blessings flow? As far as the curse is found. Just as sin affects everything and everyone, its curse has got a grip on everything, Christ has come to reach out to everything and everyone. Jesus has had a global impact. His invitation goes out to all the world to have sins forgiven and to be brought back to God. But just notice that other line that we'll sing in a moment. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. The invitation has gone out across the world. It's even reached us. But my question for you this morning is, have you received your king? Have you made room to crown Jesus as the king of your life? A, a tiny little baby who has had a global impact, but has he changed you? Let me leave you with those verses that I read earlier from John God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Let's pray together. Dear Lord our God, we thank you. Thank you so much for the smallness of the Christmas story. Thank you, Lord, that we can see in this your humility and your love that you would stoop down to us to be born in such a, a, a humble and lowly way. So Lord, we thank you that your humility didn't only stretch to the manger. Lord, we thank you that your humility stretched even to the cross. And Lord, we thank you that we can see at that cross the Saviour who is willing to die in our place. We thank you, Lord, that we can look today and we can see that across the world this message has reached and had an impact that, that stretches far beyond anything we could ever imagine. <coughs> But Lord, we pray that you would continue to have that global impact, that many more would come to trust in our small, humble, lowly Saviour. Lord, we pray all of these things in your Son's precious name. Amen.
Let's sing our closing song. After we've sung this, do stay stood up and I'll close with a short prayer. So let's sing. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. <coughs> grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.